All right, everybody, uh, welcome to today's show. We have our national recruiting expert, our favorite guy, Brandon Huffman. Welcome to the show again, Brandon. Hey, thanks for having me on. All right, today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the portal, NIL, and then we'll touch on um, you know some, some local area kids um, here in Sacramento. And um, But if you could give a background, I want to talk about how these things have intermixed and how it's kind of changed the recruiting landscape. So maybe uh, first, let's start with the portal mm -hmm. um, and kind of just a, maybe if people are out there just under just getting into the recruiting world football, what is it? Yeah, so the NCAA transfer portal exists for about six years now, and it came in around the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. Now, transferring has always existed in college football, but in the old days that you know, if you wanted to transfer, you had to get clearance and a release from your current school. They had to basically sign off and say they were going to release you. And the school would have the ability to determine where you were going to go. So Charlie Weiss, when he was the head coach of Notre Dame, famously said, if you were transferring out of Notre Dame, you could not go to a school that was on their schedule over the next three years, however much eligibility you had. Other schools would say you can't transfer into a conference school uh, over the next few years. Some schools or, or some conferences had a rule that if you transferred in a conference, you had to sit out your one year NCAA uh, sit out requirement, but then a conference requirement. So you'd have to go to a junior college to be able to play. And then in 2018, the players started to get more empowered and were given the ability to go into the portal, no questions asked, the schools couldn't hold you out, and you could transfer anywhere you wanted to. Where it all really changed, though, was about three years ago when the NCAA did away with the one-year mandatory sit-out rule. And what that did is that allowed you the opportunity to transfer and play right away. Now, up until about 2019, 2020, if you transfer, whether it was for health reasons, for personal reasons, for family reasons, for playing time reasons, you were required to sit out a year. The only way you didn't have to was if you were a graduate of a university and you're going to a graduate program, you could play right away. Uh, but even then, there were still waivers that could be full. Well, once they had the NCAA one-time sit-out rule gone, it opened the door for more transfers to come. And then fast forward about, you know, to, to probably around December, January 2024, where there was a lot of basketball players that were had already transferred once, that were looking to transfer again and be eligible. They weren't able to. Well, the NCAA uh, had an injunction put against them by a, a lower circuit court down in the southeast where sports obviously matter and the NCAA was no longer allowed to prevent you from transferring multiple times so that's just opened up the floodgates but you really started to see it happen about three years ago with the one year sit out and players were leaving whether they were starters whether they were backups and it used to be you would leave if you weren't starting you want to play time two years ago we saw the Bolitnikoff award winner Jordan Addison leave USC or sorry leave Pittsburgh after the 2021 season where he won the Blitnikoff, helped Pitt win the ACC, he transferred to USC, became Caleb Williams is one of his key targets and ended up a first round draft pick. Guys weren't leaving when they were playing. Guys were leaving if they weren't playing. Now guys are leaving after successful seasons. Caleb Williams was a starter at Oklahoma for the last half of the season and then he transferred. Jaden Daniels won the Heisman Trophy this year. He was a three-year starter at Arizona State and he transferred. I think it's something like... Five of the last six Heisman Trophy winners were guys that had transferred at one point in their career. And a couple of them predated the portal. Uh, Baker Mayfield and Kyler Murray, they transferred before the portal existed. But you know, Joe Burrow was a grad transfer. He transferred and, and won the Heisman Trophy. Devontae Smith, I think, was the last, you know, well, he was the, the only non-quarterback transfer to or non-transfer to win it. But then Bryce Young won it the next year. He too was not a transfer, but everybody else that has won it. Uh, you know, since 2000 and I believe 2016 when Lamar Jackson won it, everybody else has, has been a transfer. So it's happened in college football for, for quite some time. But the portal has really been blown up over the last six years and really over the last three years. And now you, you mix that with the uh, with NIL. Mm -hmm. And so maybe a quick back history on NIL. And then let's talk about after that, we'll talk about those two meshing and we get kind of today's environment. Yeah, so July 1st, 2021 became probably the most pivotal day in the NCAA history, whether the NCAA was ready for it, whether they wanted it or not. But that was the day that name, image, and likeness became a factor and where players could be compensated based on their own name, image, and likeness. 
got taken up to another level over the course of the next six to nine months where you know it became the phrase pay to play was starting to become a factor where now players were not getting compensated after they already got to a school they were being enticed to go to schools based on the promise of we're going to give you x amount of money for nil collectives were started players were, were getting money from commercials from endorsements from different ways, but they were no longer being punished for taking money uh, based on who they were and what position they played and what school they played for and what sport that they played. They were allowed to get NIL regardless of their collegiate affiliation. And that really changed the game because some schools that had not been good in football, but had deep pocketed boosters really used that to their advantage to get players to come to their school, i.e. Texas A&M signing one of the greatest classes in the highest ranked class in the 24 seven sports era in 2022, only to lose several of those guys and to see Jimbo Fisher lose his job. But schools that weren't necessarily having on field success knew that if they had money, they could get better. Meanwhile, schools that were having on field success, but maybe didn't have the deep pockets we're seeing their success maybe stunted a bit and having to rely solely on coaching. Well, you know, coaching is important, but if you don't have the guys on the roster to manage and to utilize that talent, it's going to hurt you. So now you're seeing guys that have been, again, multi-year starters, they're going to the portal, maybe thinking that the NFL is not going to happen, but schools will say, hey, come here, you get $50,000. Well, that $50,000 goes a long way. When you're in that transition year from your last year of playing college sports to becoming a, you know, a free agent or a potential draft pick, and so NIL started to become the, the focal point of why guys were looking at schools. And I mean, even this week, you saw Nick Saban meeting at a, a round table with some congressmen. And he said that one of the things that drove him away from coaching was that kids were no longer worried about, you know, being developed and patiently waiting to turn. It was how much am I going to get paid to play here? And I mean, I've talked to college coaches all the time at big schools, at small schools. I've I talked to coaches that are at FCS schools. And kids will come on those visits and ask, hey, what's my NIL deal going to be? And they're like, dude, we're in this little tiny town in the middle of the big sky country. We don't have an NIL deal. In fact, we're barely able to give you a full NLI to sign for a scholarship and give you a full scholarship. Half our team's walking on. What do you mean you want NIL money? So it's certainly becoming the focal point of recruiting from a recruit standpoint. Wow. That is, uh, that's quite the change, obviously, that we've gone through. And I think, obviously, NIL has led to a lot of uh, portal action. So they're mm -hmm. kind of, uh, you know, intermingled in that we have basic, I mean, we do have free agency every year in college football. How is this affecting the high school recruiting? How is that, how, how has that landscape shifted over the last couple of years? Well, for one thing, I think, you know, there's a, a misnomer, if you will, that you see it every year around December. The transfer portal is killing recruiting. It's not killing recruiting. There's still the same amount of college programs and still the same amount of roster spots. What it's doing is it's forcing players to recalibrate their expectations of where they think they can go. If you're a late bloomer, your chances of being a 25th member of a 25-man recruiting class are dwindling because now a school is going to go 17, 15 deep on high school and 10 in the portal, 10 to 12 in the portal. So it's not killing recruiting. It just maybe in years past where you could go play at a Mountain West school or sneak into a Power 5 school, you're having to go to the Big, uh, Big Sky route or the FCS route or maybe the Division II route and then bet on yourself and then hope you can move up. It's not killing recruiting. The same amount of offers and the same amount of roster spots still exist. The same amount of scholarships. Schools still have 85 scholarships at the FBS level, 63 scholarships at the FCS level, 40-something uh, at Division II, and, and so, so forth down. Um, so it's not killing recruiting. It's just recalibrating expectations, and that's the problem is everybody thinks that they're Division I. The reality is not everybody is Division I. Not everybody's Division II or, heck, they aren't even Division III. And it's not affecting it, but you're seeing schools worry about more trying to get a quicker fix in the portal rather than trying to develop somebody or a player being willing to be patient and stick it out and be developed. He wants to play right away. Well, a lot of times they don't have any film that's in college. They're trying to take a screenshot from their phone of their practice film and nobody can tell who the hell they are, but they're trying to pass it off as, hey, here's some film of me in college. And you're going into the portal and it's very risky because you weren't even playing, so why would you be attractive to a school? So it's definitely hampering the future of some guys, but a lot of it is self-inflicted. Right. Interesting. Uh, 
How about like for, for JUCO? How does that affect JUCO? Yeah, it's I've, definitely. I've heard, I've heard, I've yeah. heard it's harder for these guys, but I don't. I, I'm not specifically seeing why. Yeah, Maybe you can help help shed some light on that. That now, if there is an area that is being it is hurting, it is JUCO recruiting. It's not hurting high school recruiting, but JUCO recruiting, unless you're an uber elite player who's got full NFL measurements that can come in and be an impact player right away. You know, going to a JUCO can can hurt your recruiting because colleges now will go and find a guy who was a backup at a power five school who maybe those those clips of him from practice on his phone that he shot is more valuable than juco film because hey you're at least going up against division one players in practice every day so you know i think there was one junior college quarterback who signed with an fbs program during the early signing period and quarterbacks especially have been hammered by this but i would say juco recruiting has definitely been impacted they're, they're still you can still go play juco football and go to division one and go to a big power program it's just becoming fewer and far between because now coaches would rather have a guy even if he hasn't played and hasn't done anything who's at least been in a college weight program a, a power five or an fbs weight program with training table and all that who you know already qualified for college once you know they're a little bit more of a known commodity and, and a known risk I see. So basically, they're 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 going to still take the elite players. That that's not really an issue. It's the players that might be on the again the cusp of those roster spots that they'll just take a, a somebody that's they know has already you know been a D one player mm -hmm. and they'll take them instead of instead of those kids. So I wonder what kids in that situation could do. They just go D two. They just you know like like what what do you think? What do you think I think. That's yeah, you're seeing guys being much more willing to go to the FCS level. Some guys are willing to go to the Division II level, but a lot aren't. And a lot are still holding out hope. And then the problem is, is that they're overplaying their hand because they were so convinced, whether it was internally, whether it was by outside forces, they were Division One. that if a Division One school comes, they don't want to settle. Well, the problem is with roster management, how it is now with people trying to, with schools trying to fix their roster sooner and sooner for the following year and then some you end up a, a man without a country and that is where these guys are really being hammered and hurt is they're not having spots to land and it becomes humbling and then you're begging a school to take them and they have no more juco eligibility so uh, that's why it's it's like the same with high school recruiting if you have options you need to consider those options and bet on yourself rather than playing the long game and end up with you know in a game of musical chairs where there's no place for you to sit Okay, so would you, as a high school kid, you go go where you can play, and, you know, get film. Let's just let's just say you go, whatever. Maybe there's a D two and you can get film, right? Is that a better option than going D one, sitting the bench? Um, you know, what 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 do you what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, sometimes your best ability is availability, and if you can okay. go and you're you're playing and you're available and you go into the portal, you have an opportunity to go up. I mean. UCLA has a Division Three player coming in from Johns Hopkins. Washington had a defensive lineman that came from the University of Sioux Falls, a Division II school. It's not uncommon to see D3 and D2 guys make that jump to the Division I level. But, you know, if you have a, a opportunity to play at an FBS school, find out what the realistic chances are of you playing. But if you're going there and you're never going to see the field and you're not even going to see the field during practice, you know, what are you going to sell a school down the line? Hey, well, I played Division One. Well, no, you didn't play. You used that term very liberally. You were on the roster, but you didn't play. So how are you going to sell yourself if you don't have a lot of context to do? Well, if you go to Division Two school and you're dominating or a Division Three school or an FCS school and you're dominating, that's going to be more attractive than you having practice clips with no number on your jersey. Right. Yeah, That I, I think, yeah, playing time to me, get film, get playing time, and then you have something to show people. Mm -hmm. It's And it's tough to get practice film anyways, I think, from a lot of these schools. They hold that pretty close to the vest as well, don't they? Very much so. I mean, they, you know, college coaches as a general rule are the most paranoid people in the world outside of politicians, and they're convinced everybody's trying to steal their information and, you know, their intel and their ability to, you know, be stealth. Yeah. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting there. So, are you seeing what what kind of trends are there? Have are there trends that you're seeing right now in recruiting that are you know that that you should be aware of? This you know, maybe besides I mean, what we're about or yeah, what I would I, I would say probably the biggest trend is that rosters are being filled much sooner. You know, it used to be that okay. we saw recently with the 
early signing period now moved up two weeks in December to now the first Wednesday in December rather than the third week in December because the transfer portal has become so prominent. Schools are really pushing the spring and summer official visits and trying to have those official visits done by June. And then they want guys to be committed by July. They would like 80 to 90 percent of their class to be done by the summer so they can start turning their attention to the football season, to the following recruiting class, to their own roster retention. You know, when a college coach, one of the reasons they wanted that early signing period moved up is once the regular season ends, they got to spend a week trying to recruit their own roster, keep those guys on campus, come up with the NIL funds that they need to keep a lot of those guys. But, you know, the, the days of there being a guy in August who doesn't have a lot of attention, getting a lot of attention in the fall of the senior year, those are becoming fewer and further between than they ever have. So you're seeing the, the recruiting calendar speed up the recruiting cycle in the process where you're almost ill afforded to be a late bloomer. You know, you can bloom late in the spring of your junior year, but you're running out of time even at that point. If you don't have a lot of action, that's when you need to start recalibrating your expectations of where you think you can play and where you're probably more likely to play. So you're, you're seeing the roster management and the roster schedule really kind of squeezing out those late bloomers. Okay. Um, I'm, a, I'm a kid. I want, to, I want to get seen right now. What is the best way to get, what's the best way to get attention? I mean, the, the best way to get attention is to have something that is worth watching. You know, that that's, one of the biggest misconceptions in recruiting now, you know, and I'm old enough to remember when, you know, my first year covering recruiting was 2003 in this role. And schools would only make a highlight videotape. Yes, a videotape. You remember those VHS tapes, you know, VCR? <laughs> they would only make them for the absolute dudes on their team. You could have 80 guys on your roster, but your coach is only going to spend time making tapes for four or five guys. All right, you didn't have the superpowers like you do now back then, but they would only make four or five tapes a year. Then Huddle came along and everybody had a highlight tape. Cell phone videos came and every person had every single clip. Well, just because you have a Huddle tape does not mean you're a Division One recruit. I know a lot of kids think that. I know a lot of kids think that if they play seven on seven, they're going to get recruited. You got to have film and ability and measurables and you know the skill set to be able to play at the next level. So it's not just about right here. And you know what? Let's just cut to the crap, cut through the crap and cut to the chase. When college coaches say, oh, I want a kid who may not be as talented, but he's going to work hard. Dude, they're lying through their teeth. Yeah. Those coaches are getting paid millions of dollars to get the most talented kid who might have, you know, the heart of a, that doesn't exist, the heart of the, I don't remember what it was, the Tin Man or the Lion. It's been a long time since I saw yeah. the Wizard of Oz. But he's got physical ability that he doesn't even know what to do with. They're taking that guy over the guy who's undersized, underdeveloped, but has a big heart. Okay? Right. So just because you want it and your mom and dad want it doesn't mean you're going to get it. So the first thing you need to do is you need to have a very honest conversation with yourself. Self-scouting, self-awareness is so important because you're going to save yourself a lot of heartache when you realize, man, I'm a dog. Well, that's great. Coaches don't want dogs. They want really talented football players. If they're a dog and talented, all the better. But you've got to have that ability. And so you, you need to understand that, yeah, no kid dreams of playing NAIA football. And that's not the disrespectful to NAIA coaches. I got recruited by NAIA schools and I went to a school, I went to an NAIA school. My brother went to the same NAIA school to play football. You know, nobody dreams of it. You dream of playing at the big universities, the schools that are on NCAA football on EA Sports. Those are what you dream of. But not everybody is going to do it. You think about there's 3,500 guys a year that'll sign up at FBS school. There's 3 million high school football players a year. There's a lot of bodies and not a lot of opportunity. So you need to have the ability to be able to play at a high level if that's what your aspirations are. And you need to be honest with yourself. You need to be around people that are honest with you and not get in your feelings. The coach tells you, hey, you're probably more of a division two, II, division three guy rather than an FBS guy. You're going to save yourself time, heartache, headaches, stress, and money if you are realistic. So that's what you need more than anything. You need a realistic outlook on your own ability and what ability your what level your ability can take you to. You know, the next thing you need to have the film. It, it's got to be good film. It can't just be ability and desire. You've got to have film that pops. That is a reason coaches will watch it. 
I, I know everybody's got a huddle link. Well, you know, coaches recruit you off of your highlight film. They're going to offer you off the full game film. They want to see what you're doing when the play is not going to you, when the plays are not going successfully for you. They want to see your body language when, you know, you're called on doing something else where, you know, you drop a pass or you run a poor route or you throw an interception or you fumble the ball, you miss a tackle, you miss a block. They want to see how you're responding and, and what you're doing on that. So you've got to have the film that pops and all of that good stuff to have a coach watch you and want to come watch you more on campus or bring you to his campus to bring you to school and show you around to all the coaches to see if you're somebody that, you know, is who they want to pursue recruiting, recruiting and who they want to pursue trying to get you on their roster. So those are the, the two biggest steps is having the ability and then having the film that validates what you're hoping for. Okay. And then what about camps? Obviously we're in off season camp season, seven on seven season. What are the good ones to attend? Like which, which ones are you, are you saying? Like, is it, I know there's some mega camps. Yeah. I mean, what, what are the best ones? I think the national preps camp that'll be, there's going to be one in, in Stockton. I believe it's on April 13th. That's a great one. Anytime you can get an opportunity to get verified testing, verified measurements, height, weight, speed markers, that's important because those are going to go to all those colleges and they're going to be able to filter out and see, okay, who are the guys that are fast? Who are the guys that are, that are tall? Who are the guys that are long? Who are the guys that are heavy? Who are the guys that we want? They're going to be able to watch all those individual clips. And then in the summer, you know, in June, get to three or four college mega camps where you're going to have not just one school that's hosting it, but 30 different colleges are going to be there to watch you. Those are the camps that are important to go to because you're never going to have a better job interview than that opportunity to, to work out in front of 30 coaches, whether it's a big school, whether it's a small school or all the in-between schools, you're going to have that opportunity to catch their eye, make a name for yourself and potentially get offered. So I think national preps is good. Um, you know, those are open to pretty much everybody. And then if you can go to two or three college mega camps, maybe four over the course of June, rather than all in one weekend, you're giving yourself more opportunity and more visibility. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. That's, that's great advice there. Um, <clears throat> All right, so in the grand scheme of things, in the grand scheme of things with NIL, Portal, the trends you're seeing, um, where do you see all of this going? You see it You see it ending in a place, you see some major changes happening in, in you know, recruiting and college football. What is it that you see? I mean, it's going to end with the haves separating themselves from the have-nots. And we've seen it with you know, as we used to know, it used to be the BCS schools and the non-BCS schools. And then when the playoff era came, it became the Power Five schools and the Group of Five schools. And now with the Pac-12 dissolving, it's the Power Four and the non-Power Four schools. Um, whether it's by conference, whether it's by school, you're seeing schools like SMU essentially paying their way into a Power Four conference because they don't want to be left out of the party. It's going to eventually separate. We've already started to see in the last couple of weeks where all the talk about the SEC and the Big Ten trying to separate themselves even further from the ACC and the Big 12 and trying to get more guaranteed playoff berths or expand the playoffs before we even, I mean, we're finally seeing playoff expansion in 2024 where we have, you know, four teams for the last decade. Now you're going to have 12 teams, but before we even get to a 12 team model, there's already talk about expanding it because the power two of the power four are trying to further distance themselves from the ACC and the big 12 and, and the money that they're trying to glean from ESPN or Fox or CBS or whoever it may be. So I think you're going to still, you're going to eventually see the NCAA no longer having any jurisdiction over football. And it wouldn't be a surprise if they don't have any jurisdiction over basketball, though I'd be less surprised uh, if basketball sticks around because of the amount of money involved with the NCAA tournament and, you know, CBS is televising of that, TBS, TNT, True, all those networks, there's a billion reasons why you want to stay uh, in the NCAA for basketball. But I think eventually football, I mean, remember, there's never been an NCAA champion at the FBS level in football. It's always been voted on by the Associated Press, the USA Today coaches poll, UPI, or by the college football playoff, but there's not an officially recognized champion at the FBS level for the NCAA. It starts at the FCS, Division II, and Division III. So football has always kind of already been its own little entity, but I think it becomes exclusively its own entity uh, in, in the next seven to 10 years, if not sooner. If not sooner. Yeah, I feel like it's it's gonna go to the maybe two two super conferences and that's mm -hmm. 
that's probably all she wrote. It feels that way at least. Um, you know. But I also don't think it's going to be as dire as everybody said. I mean, I'm yeah. in my late 40s. I've been watching, you know, when we went away from the Bulls in the early 90s. I mean, I don't think kids yeah. today will ever understand how awesome New Year's Day used to be. You know, growing up, especially being growing up on the West Coast, you know, I grew up in Southern yeah. California, would go to the Rose Bowl game uh, often with my grandpa. But you would have years where you wake up at eight o'clock, you'd have the Outback Bowl on ESPN. And then at, at 10 a.m., you'd have the Citrus Bowl on ABC and you'd have the Gator Bowl on NBC. And you'd have the Cotton Bowl on CBS. And then at 1.30 or 2, you would have the Fiesta Bowl on NBC and you'd have the Rose Bowl on ABC and then at night you'd have the Orange Bowl on NBC and you'd have the Sugar Bowl on ABC and then January 2nd you'd have tears because college football season was over. When right. we got away from those bowl games and the conference affiliation to get with the BCS in the you know the, the late 90s and then eventually the BCS was the probably move to the playoffs the end was nigh was all we ever heard and yet college football went from being the fourth or fifth most popular sport in the United States after the NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, and even college basketball at times, largely because of March Madness, to now where college football is the second most profitable sport from a viewership standpoint, from a media rights deal standpoint. Um, it's the second most popular sport in the United States. So college football is not going away. I mean, there's a reason people want to play NCAA football on EA Sports. College football is popular. And with all due respect to the group of five schools and the Division II and the FCS and the Division Threes, people tune in to watch the Power Five schools. They tune in to watch Ohio State. I think they, they lead the country yearly in the highest rated games. I, I think they're the most watched team in college football, even more than Alabama. You know, big, there's a reason that Fox is yeah. every game on Saturday morning is a nine o'clock game, it seems, it, it, with Ohio State or Michigan involved. When those two teams play each other, it breaks the regular season ratings record. So for a sport that supposedly the end is near, why the hell is everybody still watching it? Because college football is still absolutely a treat to watch. Yeah, I think um, to your point earlier, the, uh, the the New Year's Day Bowls back in the day, I mean, there were no opt-outs back None. then. That's probably no. an important, important distinction. If you watch the Georgia – uh florida state game this year i mean that yeah was the spring game that they played in the bowl uh, the, yeah and the, yeah exactly right it was just it was ridiculous and like that but that didn't happen back then because everybody played played your hardest you i mean you were, you were out to to win it didn't matter the bowl game and so those days are gone though and and you know we're, we're where we're at i think i think the expansion of the playoffs in my opinion is 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 good i like it um you know since that's where we're at and and i think uh hopefully uh, we get some more competitive early games, you know. I mean, we've had some we've had some pretty lackluster ones. This year was this year was uh, good, but you know, I feel like um, the expanded playoffs going to hopefully give us a chance to see some major upsets and you know, what, kind of what you get in March Madness, but the football version of that. And I'm hoping you know that's what we start to see mm -hmm. a little bit. There will be less, I think, because there's more parity, you know, in in basketball, a lot more parity in in college basketball than there is in college football, but. You know, it's, I, it's how you end up with the Gonzaga in the championship game, a San Diego State in the championship game, a FAU in the Final Four. College basketball, you only need one or two guys, and you only, only need two good weekends in you know March to potentially play for a national championship. I mean, yeah. college football, you just don't see the upsets that you do in college basketball. And in, in college football, they're still, by the, by the middle of the fourth quarter, you know, you might have a close game for the first quarter, but then eventually talent usually starts to outweigh the the grit. But in basketball, yeah. you can keep getting hot if you're a good little three-point shooting team and you're knocking off. I mean, we've seen the number one seed go down last year in the NCAA tournament. We saw all the number one seeds essentially being out by the, the Sweet 16. In football, people complain we always see the same top teams in the championship game. Yeah, because usually in football... Those top teams in September, the top teams in December, and in January, we're in college basketball on any given Thursday or Friday, mayhem can happen. That's what makes the tournament so great, but also why college football is such a haves versus have-nots already, and you sure as hell want to be in the haves. Yeah, that's what you're. Yeah, that's a really good point there. All right, so maybe uh, shifting gears here a little bit, um, talk a little bit about some uh, Sacramento area kids that have, you know raised their stock since the last time that we talked during the mm -hmm. football season? Yeah. 
You know, one of the players that I think has probably been recruited heavier than just about anybody in the 2025 class in the Sacramento area is Josiah Sharma. You know, he is at Folsom High School now, previously was at Intercom. Um, you know, getting a chance to see him on the 7 on 7 circuit as a tight end with coaches under construction. Uh, I mean, I didn't do a lot of tight end, but he's a guy that he's showing up at all these events and he's reshaped his body. And he went from being a lightly recruited guy, I think in this fall, he had offers from Nevada, Washington, and Arizona. To where now he's got offers from Alabama and Texas and Oklahoma, and you know two of the four teams that played in the national championship game, or in the playoffs last year were Alabama and Texas, and he's got offers from those both. Mind you, he also committed the day of the Sugar Bowl to the University of Washington, who played in the championship game. So he's probably seen his stock rise the most of anybody in the Sacramento area. Uh, another guy that I think is he's really starting to see his stock rise uh, in the 2025 class is Luca Namatwani, uh, who is at Elk Grove High School, defensive end, edge rusher, uh, quick guy. Uh, he just took an unofficial visit to UCLA over the weekend, uh, but he's another player who you know kind of seen his stock rise since his first offer came in December. Um, you know, so in the 2025 class, those are kind of the two that have been the more recent risers. But then you also have, you know, Caleb Edwards, who is the top offensive recruit in Northern California. And he has been for the better part of a year, one of the top tight ends on the West Coast and nationally, already been selected to play in the All-American Bowl. He has maintained his level as an elite tight end prospect nationally this year. Um, you know, and he's a guy that I think he's very unconventional, if you will, in the recruiting process. You know, a lot of these guys, they want to be recruited, they want to be called, they want to be courted, they want everybody to, to, to reach out to them and talk to them. And he's kind of laid low and just kind of let his game do the talking. And so he's been, you know, pretty interesting to, to watch over the last six to nine months and that he just wants to go play football. He's a basketball and baseball player too, multi-sport athlete. I think you said he used to be a skateboarder too, you know, so he just, I don't want to say, yeah, when he, when he was younger, so I, I don't want to say he marches to the beat of his own drum, but it, it doesn't move him like a lot of kids who are so thirsty for the social media attention. And his play validates why all these schools are after him. Right, right. Um, let's see a couple others. What about, uh, so Carter Jackson, he was, mm -hmm. he's looked pretty impressed. What do you think about him? Yeah, I mean, he's one of those guys that committed early in the process. He committed, I think, last June uh, to the University of California. He still had some schools coming after him, even since his commitment to Cal. Uh, Ole Miss was one of the more recent offers that he got. I think Wyoming offered him recently. Uh, was at Folsom to start, went to Granite Bay. Now he's back at Folsom. Uh, a lot of weapons there for, for Ryder Lions, who we could talk about in a bit, but uh, a school that likes to chuck the rock. And, you know, he's going there knowing that it is a school that wants to pass the ball. But, you know, he's putting it all together on the track field this year. I know track's been a big thing for him, just showing that elite speed and that, that long speed that, that he possesses. And, you know, not the biggest guy. So if you're going to be a smaller back, you've got to have speed and explosiveness. And he's been working on that to show that he has both of those. Yeah, he, I was at, um, they have some time trials there at Folsom. And I don't know if you heard or not, but he ran a 10-5 hand time. Not bad. Uh, hand time. Okay. Yeah, hand timed. And I think he was he was smart enough. I think he when I don't remember which school, you know, was talking to him, but I think he, he played it off like it was like ten seven or ten nine because he knew it was, you know, his hand time, so he's he played it lower. But I I I've heard that the actual hand time was a ten five, which is sure. crazy. So um another kid I wanted to ask you about a twenty six kid from the area who I was impressed with this last year. And just let me know if you're you're familiar. I'm sure you're familiar with him, but um Reeves Sloan. Mm-hmm. Yeah, got a chance to see him uh, about a month ago when I was at the Game Fit Combine in Sacramento. Um, you know, he's a player that I think is going to really see his stock rise this spring. You know, a lot of guys don't necessarily want an elite prospect at their same position in their backyard. But what that does is that that draws coaches. When coaches come, you know, whether he, he likes it or not, whether a lot of quarterbacks like it or not, when you've got a guy like Ryder Lyons, whether he's in the same class as you, a class older, a class younger, and you're bringing college coordinators and quarterback coaches to town to watch him throw, they're going to make the most of their time. They're not just going to stop at Folsom. They're going to head out to other schools, and that's where Reed's going to have the opportunity to, to be a guy that's going to have extra eyeballs on him that maybe 
wouldn't have happened if there wasn't a heavily recruited quarterback like Ryder. But he's a guy that I think in his own right is, is a very talented quarterback. Got his first offer from Utah State uh, and could potentially add plenty more uh, between now and the spring. And he's got two years of high school football left too. So a lot of, a lot of football left for him, but already on the map. And he's going to have that opportunity to throw for a lot of schools this offseason. Yeah, he's a good basketball player too, and and so I've, I've watched him, you know, a little bit growing up there, um, you know, same class as my son. But I was really impressed uh, with how far or how explosive he was running the ball. Because mm -hmm. I watched him a couple times, and I was like, wow, I didn't realize he was that explosive with the ball. Like mm -hmm. when, it, when it was time to run, he can actually, he can really run. And he can sling it too. Yeah, absolutely. And he, you know, it doesn't hurt. And another player that I should probably uh, mention while we're talking about Rockland, that's uh, kind of a, a, a riser of the sauce season is Garrison Blaine, who I saw at that same event in Game Fit. And, you know, saw him at the All-American Bowl Combine back in January, some of the Game Fit Combine last month. He was the offensive line MVP there. And another guy who's kind of reshaped his body, gotten stronger and more trim, and is seeing that suck run. But when you're a guy like Reeves Sloan, you've got an offensive lineman like that protecting for you. You get to show off your ability to run. You get to show off your ability to, to drop back in the pocket and throw. And so, uh, again, a guy that I think is trending up in the right direction right now. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so let's talk uh, – let's get to Ryder Lions. So mm – -hmm. Um, he has now a full year of his uh, of varsity film, and you saw him during the season. I know uh, rankings are coming out. I'm not going to ask you for a spoiler or anything like that. I know where I have him on my, my board, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, but um, what are your thoughts on him? I mean, I, I think, in my opinion, he is the best quarterback out West in high school football. I'm not just saying in the 2026 class. If I had to start a, a, if I was a college coach and I had to pick a quarterback, I mean, the 2025 class at quarterback out West is pretty strong with Houston Longstreet, with TJ Latif, um, Jackson Colick. For my money, I think Ryder Lyons is the best high school quarterback out West right now, regardless of class. I think he, you know, is in a, among the top five, six quarterbacks nationally, regardless of class. And I think he will very much be a contender for QB1, the 2026 class, when those rankings update later on this spring. Yeah. yeah. There is a reason he was the first West Coast quarterback invited to the All-American Bowl in the 25 or the 26 class. That's incredible. So, yeah, I just, I look and I say, where's your, where's the ceiling on him? And it seems like it's just, it's sky's the limit, I think, for, for, for Ryder Lions. Uh, yeah, I mean, the ceiling is, Michael Jordan said it, the ceiling is the roof. Uh, really, the, the biggest thing Ryder needs, you know, the only ceiling he has, he's still got two more years of high school football. So you really aren't going to be able to see what he can do at the collegiate level till 2026. And that's assuming he doesn't serve an LDS mission like Walker, his older brother, is doing. Uh, right. You know, I know there are a lot of people that were probably bummed, and rightfully so, because the season that Austin Mack had in 2022 in his first year as a starter and the numbers he put up, you know, you lose a guy like that after just one year under his belt and he goes to college early. And then Ryder takes it a step further and wins the state championship and, and basically wills his team to a victory in that state championship game over a team from my hometown, uh, St. Bonaventure, with all due respect to all the St. Bonaventure players. Ha ha. Ventura High School, class of 94. Boom. You know, uh, <laughs> you guys used to have to borrow our stadium back when you guys were a mediocre program. But now you, you guys are a power. But, you know, seeing a guy like, like Ryder and what he can do statistically, but more importantly, when you're looking for a quarterback, you want that guy that's got it, the it factor. And yeah. Ryder has it to levels that you don't see a lot of guys his age and his class have it, and he's got it. And then he's got the ability to make all the throws, the ability to run and score with the ball in his hand. When you've got a quarterback who's got the it factor and all the physical tools, that makes for a pretty damn heavily recruited quarterback, which Ryder already is. Yeah, that's fantastic. Really appreciate that stuff. I think um, that's all I have for today. So really appreciate all of your valuable insight every time you're on the show. It's just, uh, it's fantastic, man. Really appreciate you. Glad to be here. Awesome, brother. All right, I'll catch up with you next time. Thank you so much. You betcha.